Let, can I ask you a question about Russia, Michael? Uh, there is a raging uh, debate in, in Russia for, for many years now between the, let's say, the Eurasianists and the Atlanticists. Uh, it involves, of course, economic policy under Putin, uh, industrial capitalism, Russian style. And uh, the, the Eurasianists basically say that the central problem with Russia is how the Russian central bank is basically affiliated with all the mechanisms that you know so well. That is an Atlanticist Trojan horse inside the Russian economy. How do you see it? Uh, the, the, Russia was brainwashed by the West when it, uh, the Soviet Union broke up in 1991. Uh, they, uh, they were convinced not that somehow uh, you had, first of all, the IMF announced in advance, there was a big meeting in Houston with the IMF and the World Bank and the IMF published all of its reports saying, first you need to wipe out all, you don't want inflation in Russia, so let's wipe out all of the Russian savings with hyperinflation, uh, which they did. Uh, they then said, well, now to cure the hyperinflation, uh, the Russian central bank needs a stable, uh, a stable currency and you need to back it with a currency. You need to back it with US dollars. So uh, in from the early 1990s, as you know, labor was going unpaid. Russia central bank could have created the rubles to pay the domestic labor and to keep the factories in place. But uh, the uh, IMF advisors from Harvard uh, said, no, you have to borrow US dollars. The, uh, I, met with, uh, an, uh, I met with people, uh, the Hermitage Fund and Renaissance Fund and others who had meetings and uh, I met with the investors and they were, the rate in Russia was paying 100% interest per year to leading uh, American uh, uh, money uh, financial institutions financial, for dollars yeah. that it didn't need. It could have created itself. Russia was so dispirited with, uh, with Stalinism, essentially, that it thought, uh, what's the opposite of Stalinism? It must be what they have in America. And they thought that America was going to tell it how America got rich. But America didn't want to tell Russia how it got rich. It wanted <laughs> to make money off Russia. They didn't get it. They they trusted the Americans. They thought some, they didn't understand. Uh, uh, they didn't. Uh, they really didn't understand that uh, industrial capitalism that Marx described had metamorphosized into finance capitalism and was completely different. And that's because Russia didn't charge rent. It didn't charge interest. Uh, it, and uh, I gave a number of. Uh, I gave three speeches before the Duma, uh, urging it to. Uh, uh, impose uh, a land tax. Uh, some of the people uh, I noticed Ed Dodson was on here, he was uh, 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 there with us. And we were all trying to convince Russia, don't let this uh, be, uh, be privatized. If you let it be privatized, then you're going to have uh, such high rents and housing costs in Russia that you're not going to be able to uh, essentially compete with uh, foreign industrial growth. Well, the uh, the politician who brought us there, uh, Vyacheslav Zelensky, uh, was sort of maneuvered out of election by the American advisors. The Americans put uh, billions of dollars in to to essentially finance uh, propaganda, American propagandists to destroy Russia, mainly the uh, uh, from the Harvard Institute of International Development, and uh, uh, essentially they were. Uh, a bunch of gangsters, and uh, the uh, the Federal Reserve of uh, the the prosecutors in New York were about to prosecute them. Uh, not in New York, in Boston. New York was dominated by Wall Street, so uh, the uh, Attorney General of Boston was going to bring a big case uh, for Harvard against uh, the looting of Russia and the corruption of Russia. And I was asked to organize, uh, to bring a number of Russian uh, politicians and uh, industrialists over to say how uh, this had destroyed uh, everything. Well, ha Harvard settled out of court, pleading no. <laughs> Uh, uh, and uh, essentially uh, kept uh, uh, made uh, uh, the perpetrators the leading university uh, people uh, people up there. I'm associated with Harvard's anthropology department, not the economics. Yeah. Not, uh, not economics, yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so the, the case never, uh, I, we never had a chance to bring my witnesses uh, and have uh, our report on, uh, on what happened. But uh, uh, I publish uh, the fact 
uh, I published for the Russian Academy of Sciences uh, a long study of how all of this destruction of Russia was laid out in advance at the Houston meetings by the IMF and the Russians somehow thought, uh, uh, when I say the Russians, America went to the uh, uh, leading bureaucrats who headed government uh -huh. and said, look, we can make you rich. You, why don't you register the factories in your own name? And if you're registered in your own name, you know, then you'll own it, and then uh, you can cash out. You can uh, essentially uh, sell, but obviously you can't sell to the Russians because the IMF have just wiped out all of their savings. You can only cash out by selling to the West. And so the Russian stock market became the leading stock market in the world from uh, 1994 with the uh, Norris Nickel and the seven bankers and the bank of loans for shares deal through uh, 1997. And, uh, uh, it, I'd worked for a firm, uh, Scudder Stevens, and uh, the uh, uh, head advisor, a former student of mine, didn't want to invest in Russia because she said, this is just a ripoff. It's going to crash. She was fired for not, they said, look, we know it's going to crash. That's the whole idea. It's going to crash. We can make a mint off it before the crash. And then we can make, when it crashes, we can make another mint by selling short. And then by buy selling short, yeah, yeah. And uh -huh. do it all over again. Well, the problem is that the system that was put in with the privatization that's occurred, uh, how, do you, uh, how do you have Russia's wealth used to develop its own industry and its own economy like China was doing? Well, China has rules for all of this, but Russia doesn't have a rule. It's really all centralized. It's uh, President Putin uh, that keeps it this way. Well, uh, the, this is the great fear of the West. Uh, when you, uh, you had uh, Yevgeny Gorbachev uh, began to plan uh, to do pretty much what is done today to, to restrain uh, private capital, uh, the IMF said, pulled off, it said, we're not going to make any loans to stabilize the Russian currency until you remove Mr. Gorbachev. The U.S. said, we won't deal with you until you remove him. So he was pushed out, and he was probably the smartest guy at the time there. So they, mm -hmm. they thought that Putin was going to be sort of a patsy, and he, uh, it, he's sort of almost single-handedly holding the uh, oligarchs in and saying, look, you can keep your money as long as you do exactly what you, uh, the government would do. Uh, and you can gain, keep the gains as long as you're serving the public interest. But none of this is created into a legal system, a tax system, uh, and, a, and a system where the government actually does uh, get most of the benefit. Russia could have emerged in 1991 as the most competitive economy in Eurasia by giving all of the houses to its people. Every, instead of giving Neuros Nickel and the uh, oil uh, companies to uh, uh, to Yukos and to Korakovsky, yeah. it could have given everybody their own house and their own apartment. Uh, the same thing in the Baltics. And instead, it, it didn't give the land uh, to the people. And uh, Russia was uh, Russians were paying 15% of their income for uh, housing in 1990. And that was low, you know, whereas, no, no, I'm sorry, it was 3%. 3% of their income. 3%. Uh, 3%. And uh -huh. in the West, it was 30% to 40%. Uh, uh, Russia could have had, and that rent is the largest element in everybody, every homeowner's budget. Uh, so Russia could have had low priced labor. It could have uh, financed uh, all of its capital investments to the government by taxing, uh, collecting the, the rising rental value. And instead, uh, Russian uh, uh, real estate was privatized on credit. And it was even worse in the Baltics. Uh, re in Latvia, where I was research director for the Riga Graduate School of Law, the uh, Latvia borrowed uh, primarily from Swedish banks. Uh, mm -hmm. And so you, you had, in order to buy a house, uh, you had to borrow from the Swedish banks, caught in, and uh, they said, well, we're not going to lend in the Latvian currency because it can go down. You'll, you'll b borrow and you have a choice, Swiss francs or German marks or, or US dollars. And so they, they, all of this rent was paid in foreign currency, became an outflow that uh, essentially drained the, all the Baltic economies. Uh, Latvia's lost 20% of its population. Uh, Estonia and uh, Lithuania followed suit. And you, uh, of course, the worst hit was uh, Russia by neoliberalisms. And uh, as you know, President Putin said that neoliberalism cost Russia more of its population loss than World War II 
uh, did. And, uh, and you know that the way to destroy a country, you don't need an army to destroy a country anymore. All you have to do is teach it American economics. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Then it's, I remember it's, well. I, I arrived in Russia in '91, uh, in the winter of '91, coming from China. So this this was a, I, I transited from uh, the Chinese miracle. Um, in fact, a few days after Deng Xiaoping's famous uh, Southern tour, when he went to Guangzhou and Shenzhen, and that was the kick for the for the 1990s a boom. In fact, now a few years before the handover, and then I took the Trans Siberian and I arrived in Moscow a few days after the end. In fact, in fact a few weeks after the end of the Soviet Union. But the but the Amer I remember the Americans arrived almost at 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 the exact minute, wasn't it, Michael? I think they already were there in uh, in the spring of 1992, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, it was the Houston meeting in 1990. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh huh. But all, all before that, already in uh, 1988, 1989, there was a huge outflow of embezzlement money via uh, Latvia. Uh, uh, uh -huh. the assistant dean of the university, uh, and uh, who ended up uh, creating Nordex. Uh, essentially, the, the money was all flowing out because Latvia was where uh, Ventspils was, where Russian oil was exported, and it was all f fake invoicing. So the Russian kleptocrats basically made their money off false export invoicing, uh, ostensibly selling it for one price and having the rest paid abroad. And uh, uh, this was uh, all organized uh, through Latvia and uh, the man later uh, moved to Israel and finally uh, finally gave a billion dollars back to Russia so that uh, he wanted to live safely for the rest of his life uh, in Israel. Well, the crash of the ruble in 1998 was what? Roughly one year after the crash of the BAT and the whole Asian financial crisis. Nah? It was interlinked, of course. But uh, uh, let me see if I have a question for you, in fact. I'm just thinking out loud now. If uh, the economies of Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia, the, uh, the case of North, North Korea, uh, South Korea, sorry, and Russia were more integrated at the time as they are trying to integrate now, do you think that the Asian financial crisis would have been preventable in 1997? Well, look at what happened in Malaysia with uh, Mohammed Mahathir. Yes. Uh, uh, Malaysia avoided it, so of course it was preventable. And they had uh, capital controls, right? Uh, capital con controls. Uh, that was what you did. All you would have needed was to do what Malaysia did. So, uh, if, uh, But you needed uh, an economic theory for that. And uh, essentially, if uh, the current mode of warfare is to conquer the brains of a country, to shape how people think and how they perceive the economy from working. And if you can twist their view into an unreality economics, where they think that you're there to help them, not to take money out of them, then you've, you've got them hooked. And that was what happened in Asia. Asia thought it was getting rich off the dollar inflows. And then yeah. uh, the IMF and the uh, all the uh, creditors pulled the plug crashed the industry. And now that all of a sudden you had a crash, they bought up Korean industry and other South Asian industries, you know, it, it, uh, give away prices. That's what you do. You lend the money, you pull the plug, you then you, uh, you, for, you let them go under and you pick up the pieces. That's what Blackstone did after the Obama uh, depression began, when Obama uh, saved the banks, not the, uh, uh, the not his constituency, the mortgage owners. Uh, essentially, that, that's Blackstone's up modus operandi, pick up pick up distress prices at a bankruptcy sale. But you need to lend money and then crash it in order to uh, make that work. 